Welcome, everybody. And um, I'm going to very quickly introduce the Kleptocracy Initiative of Hudson Institute uh, and uh, mainly introduce Senator Whitehouse. And we're very honored to have him here today. Uh, and um, so anyway, when we started this Kleptocracy Initiative in 2015, our primary objective was to show how authoritarian regimes threatening US national security are structured as kleptocracies political system in which grand corruption is not only a pervasive feature of government, but its guiding principle and chief export. However, it has become increasingly clear that the economic foundations of authoritarianism lie not within Russia or China, but right here in Western financial centers and the offshore jurisdictions on which they depend. Globalized kleptocrats are exploiting networks of anonymous shell companies created and serviced by Western and corporation agents, lawyers, bankers, and other professionals to merge corrupt wealth into our economy and import corrosive values and practices into the heart of our society. Stealth concentrations of illicit wealth pose nothing less than a civilizational threat. But given that we now hold a sizable portion of our enemy's economic power within our own shores, it is also a tremendous opportunity to turn the tables and exercise some economic influence of our own. In order to unlock this leverage and regain the moral authority needed to wield it effectively, we must begin by ending the ability to create anonymous shell companies here in the United States. This is the central theme of Casey Michel's United States of Anonymity, and one which I am sure he will expand upon shortly. Before that, however, we are honored to be joined by Senator Sheldon Whitehouse. Senator Whitehouse has served the people of Rhode Island in various distinguished offices since entering public service in 1984, including as Director of Business Regulation, U.S. Attorney for the District of Rhode Island, and Rhode Island Attorney General. He was elected Senator for Rhode Island in 2007. Since then, he has been responsible for passing important legislation on environmental issues, health care, and unemployment, to name a few. Senator Whitehouse's congressional career is distinguished by his willingness and talent to work across the aisle and a dedication to fighting special interests when they operate against the best interests of ordinary Americans. Senator Whitehouse, in particular, has shown extraordinary leadership in raising awareness of the harm caused by U.S. anonymous shell companies and unparalleled commitment to pursuing their abolition by Congress. His bipartisan True Incorporation Transparency for Law Enforcement, or TITLE, T-I-T-L-E, Act, would require US states to collect beneficial ownership information about companies being registered within their jurisdiction. This is the primary recommendation of United States of Anonymity. So we're especially pleased that Senator Whitehouse is on hand to lend his expertise and experience to our discussion. The Senator is also a sponsor of the similarly bipartisan Combating Money Laundering, Terrorist Financing, and Counterfeiting Act, which would close many of the financial loopholes currently being abused by kleptocrats and other criminals. This legislation <laughs> builds on other efforts, including the Stop Tax Haven Abuse Act, Offshoring Prevention Act, and Disclose Act, which targets opaque campaign financing. It is thanks to the sustained efforts of Senator Whitehouse and his co-sponsors on both sides of the aisle, that we now stand a real chance of abolishing anonymous companies, arresting the global spread of authoritarian power, and as the Senator has put it on previous occasions, helping to reestablish America's reputation as that city upon a hill. Senator Whitehouse. Thank you um, so much for being here. Let me first thank uh, the Hudson Institute and within it the Kleptocracy Initiative for what you are doing 
every once in a while, a really big new idea emerges that has the chance to shape policy in a whole variety of areas. I think we are here at the birth of one of those significant new ideas, significant new paradigms. And I really want to salute the leadership of Hudson Institute in propagating and documenting that new paradigm and in the work of the kleptocracy initiative to put specifics uh, into the general broad idea. Um, it was years ago that Samuel Huntington posited the doctrine or the theory of a clash of civilizations. And he looked at cultural and religious divisions as the boundaries of that clash. I think he had a fairly good idea, but I think the real clash of civilizations that the world faces right now is quite a different one. And it is a clash between countries and societies that reflect the rule of law and honor civil and property rights as opposed to what St. Augustine uh, described as great bands of robbers. What is government without justice but great bands of robbers? And in the part of this earth that is beyond that rule of law regime of civil rights and property rights runs a very different regime of kleptocracy, of criminality, of authoritarian abuse. And there, I think, is where we find the true clash between civilizations. When you look at how we live in our rule of law world, and when we look at the threats to that rule of law world, whether it is that we will be the victims of crime, of cyber attack, of intellectual property theft, of terrorism, of having to deploy our resources to keep peace and try to bring some measure of justice in other areas, all of those hazards emerge in very significant ways from the territories that are controlled by the great bands of robbers. So we are not, I don't believe, in a position to live with equanimity about the conditions in those non rule of law regimes. The things that happen there will come home to hurt us. There is a necessary knock-on effect from living in that kind of a society of dissatisfaction, injustice, hopelessness, and ultimately extremism in the face of that injustice and hopelessness that creates a massive peril for our rule of law society. Unfortunately, we are not just viewing the kleptocracy and the criminality on the other side of this clash of civilizations with equanimity we are actually supporting and enabling it. We are in many respects serving as the agents of our own harm or destruction. And to call attention to that problem is I think at the highest order of policy initiative that can be done. So back to where I started, thank you so much to the Hudson Institute 
and to the Kleptocracy Initiative for your focus on this. We need to redefine the way we think about some of these issues and put it into this context, because in this context, there is a lot that can be done. It's easy to say, well, terrorism is a matter of extremism. There's not much we can do about it. The situation is kind of hopeless. We'll go bomb them. We'll go kill them. We'll try to cordon them off. But when you look at it in the context of rule of law versus kleptocracy and extremism, suddenly solutions begin to come into focus. Suddenly, ways to actually make things better begin to become apparent. And that, I think, is the greatest value. This is not just a great and important new idea. It is a great and important new idea that allows us to deploy really effective measures. And we simply have to recognize that we cannot afford, from a national security perspective, to be supporting the international criminals and kleptocrats who are creating the conditions for terrorism, extremism, violence, and the degradation of human society. We simply cannot do that. We have a task ahead of us. So let me move to a second point. If it were just our national security self-interest directly, this would still be a very important thing, but there's one added point, as Charles mentioned. The United States has long stood before the world not just as a powerful military force, but as a powerful example. Whether you go back to John Winthrop, recently echoed by Ronald Reagan, as describing our experiment as a city on a hill, or whether you go back to the Bunker Hill speech of um, Daniel Webster, echoed recently by Bill Clinton, saying that no example of our power has ever mattered as much in the world as the power of our example. America stands for something. I grew up in the Foreign Service. I'm the son, grandson, nephew, and cousin of Foreign Service officers. I have lived personal experience that it matters to be American. When you're overseas, my dad used to say, the other country might like to tweak the eagle's beak because we are so powerful and giving us a little bit of comeuppance is a source of joy and satisfaction for many. But when the chips are down, there is no competition to the United States of America in the world in the hopes and the dreams and the aspirations of people everywhere. There is no alternative. We are it. And that is not necessarily a burden that we bear. That is also an asset that we command. Because that power of example attracts people to us, because they trust us in a different way, because the hope as you step out of your home every morning that life doesn't have to be like it is for you in your crooked, kleptocratic, economically hopeless situation, because there stands America as an example and a rebuke to life as you're forced to live it, that is a powerful force for us. There is a problem, though. If you want to be the example, you have to live the example. And right now, with the European Union and the United Kingdom cleaning up incorporation, non-transparency, with the rest of the rule of law world moving towards a more transparent, regime that allows kleptocratic and criminal conduct to be pursued more fulsomely, a lot of that's going to move to America, where we still allow the prime vehicle for this enabling of the non-rule of law, the bands of robbers part of the world, which is the Shell Corporation, the anonymous hidden Shell Corporation.
And if you want to be really clever, you stack a few of them together so that you have a shell corporation behind a shell corporation with another shell corporation behind that and another shell corporation behind that and three or four semi-crooked lawyers who will all assert attorney-client privilege about who's behind it if you actually do get a warrant and start to try to dig through it. So it is really important to us from a national security imperative in the most sort of tangible sense of that, but it is also a really important thing for us in the national security intangible of America serving as an example to the world. If we become known throughout the world as the enablers of the crooked, criminal, and corrupt, then the resentment of those populations for what has been done to them by the crooked, the criminal, and the corrupt will splash onto us with predictable bad effects. We simply have a national obligation to our traditions, to our founding fathers, to our role in the world, and to our national security to make sure that we are not a part of the problem and that we turn around and become part of the solution. I'll close by saying that I do think that the title bill clarifying that shell corporations have to cough up a beneficial owner at some point for law enforcement to have access to is a absolutely critical piece of this. We are seeing very good progress through the Helsinki Commission, which is beginning to make this an issue. Charles was a particularly brilliant testimony uh, witness in providing testimony before our last hearing. The Judiciary Committee just had a hearing on this general issue and the witness panels were unanimous about the importance of solving the Shell Corporation problem. We've been promised another hearing early next year specifically on this bill. And if you look to the recent reports about Russian interference by CSIS and by the Atlantic Council, both the Kremlin playbook and the Kremlin Trojan horse reports point directly at the importance of transparency in protecting against those particular hazards. So um, I am very excited to be here. I'm very proud of the work that you are doing. I think we are here at the birth of a great idea that has the potential to shift in very important ways the way we look at some of the problems that bedevil us now and to protect us against becoming further the agents of our own destruction. Thank you so very much. I'll just very briefly introduce Casey, and I hope he'll introduce himself a little more because he knows more about himself than I know about him, uh, but, uh, <laughs> he, uh, but he, he traveled uh, to produce this report, and there are a f a some interesting things that he uncovered, let me say that. Otherwise, Casey is a, uh, a young uh, journalist, and um, he will tell us a little more about himself before he presents the paper. It's supposed to be on, no? It is? Oh, I was speaking too softly, maybe. All right, anyway, Casey? Uh, <clears throat> I would uh, like to start by thanking everyone for coming today. It's a, a treat to see all of you. I would especially like to thank the Hudson Institute, specifically Charles, uh, and, and Nate Sibley, who's here today, who's helped put this all together. Uh, without their support, without their interests, without their desire to see something like this put into the public sphere, increased knowledge, increased interest, this wouldn't have happened. So thank you. Uh, I'd also like to thank, thank the senator, although he has since uh, uh, headed out for a vote. Uh, he has been at the absolute fore of pushing for increased oversight, increased transparency, and increased interest and public awareness in this phenomenon of anonymity and how the U.S. has transformed into a global offshore haven. So I'm going to take about 15 minutes, 10, 15 minutes or so, just to run through this report, and then I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Blum for a, uh, a response. 
Hopefully he agrees with much of what I have to say. If not, I'll take his criticisms in stride. <laughs> the, uh, the report, as the title indicates, examines how the US transformed, and has transformed over the past few years into a bastion of financial anonymity. Uh, it, is, uh, it has taken place through two primary parallel trends. On the one hand, you have short-sighted, myopic federal policy that has played a role in this increased transition. But on the other hand, and, and more importantly, I would argue, and I think Charles would argue, and the senator has certainly argued as well, you have this growth of an industry within a handful of American states, states like Nevada and Delaware, Wyoming, South Dakota, that have allowed the US to transition into this four of global transparency, primarily through things like anonymous shell companies. Uh, these states have taken on all the trappings of things that we would consider to be captured states. Uh, countries we, we associate most closely with uh, havens in, in the South Pacific, in the Caribbean, uh, you know, the Isle of Man and Cyprus, taking root directly here uh, in the US that have brought any number of kleptocrats and arms dealers, oligarchs, nefarious actors looking to park their cash, park their assets here in the US, purchasing high rises in Manhattan and uh, beachfront condos in Malibu through anonymous American legal entities, and you have Americans on the ground here in the country doing this perfectly legally, all in the service of aiding these kleptocrats, these American adversaries, uh, all the while. Uh, as I begin, it's worth keeping a little bit of context in mind. Uh, according to the Tax Justice Network, we're looking at over $30 trillion in offshore wealth. And that's not including things like real estate or uh, uh, the yachts that I know I'm not gonna be getting for Christmas. Uh, it's worth noting also that this is just one vantage and, and this is just one report. Um, this is, as Global Witness has written, this is, this is just the tip of the iceberg that we're looking at. Uh, so firstly, taking a broader kind of federal look uh, at this, there, there are two realities worth keeping in mind. One is, is the US's sheer size. It's a massive country. It creates more legal entities than the next 40 tax havens combined. So we have to keep that in mind. It simply has more resources on hand. But there's another fact that a couple years ago, under the Obama administration, the US decided not to join the OECD's uh, common reporting standards to combat financial secrecy. Instead, the US created its own parallel system called the, financial, uh, the Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act. Now these programs were broadly similar, uh, uh, forcing foreign banks to disclose business with clients who are nationals, but the US has avoided reciprocity to a far greater degree than the European counterparts. And this has led some to call the US the biggest tax haven in the world or the world's largest offshore center. As one pointedly said, some are saying the US is now the new Switzerland. So I don't know what that leaves Switzerland as. Uh, that's one aspect. But the other aspect that I found in my research and in my travels is that the US's transition to a global offshore center hasn't taken place here in Washington. It's taken place in places like Wilmington, Delaware, Reno, Nevada, Cheyenne, Wyoming, and Pierce, South Dakota. Small states that can't compete with the larger ones in terms of uh, industrial output or, or, or startup support that pertains to states where legislators, state level legislators, have been effectively co-opted by higher-ups and lobbyists for firms that are at the threshold of developing means of financial secrecy, both as it pertains to trusts and especially anonymous shell companies. These are the tools that kleptocrats, arms dealers, oligarchs, American adversaries use to entrench their own power, to deter the broader liberal project, and to uh, uh, undercut American interests writ large. There are state officials in places like Wyoming and Nevada and Delaware who are actively providing the tools for these kleptocrats, for these arms dealers, for these oligarchs. They're making money, they don't care, and Washington thus far has not done enough to clamp down on them. That's what these Americans are doing, and that's what these Americans are doing perfectly legally. Uh, shell companies are, are, are perfectly legal. There's, there, there's no statute that prohibits the formation of a shell company, which again is a company that has no real assets, no real employees, is simply used as a vehicle to move money for again, purchasing that high rise in Manhattan or that beachfront in Malibu. They're used in the vast majority 
of most recent cases of grand corruption. And tax assessors and journalists and investigators, especially when these shell companies are stacked upon one another, are none the wiser. That is what the US has perfected. That is the types of shell companies that the US can provide no questions asked. It's not taking place in the British Virgin Islands. It's not taking place in the Cayman Islands. It's not taking place in other traditional tax havens nearly to the extent that it is taking place here in the US. Nobody knows who's setting these up. Nobody knows who's funding them. Nobody knows where the money's coming from. All we know is that state officials, state budgets are taking a cut of these companies. The people setting up these companies are taking a cut. But we don't know who's behind them. There's one quote from a lawyer who focuses on, on tax companies, uh, or I'm sorry, on uh, shell companies, that I think is worth, worth reading. He said earlier this year, it, it's not entirely beyond the realms of possibility that ISIS could be operating companies and trust funds domiciled in Delaware. And that could go for Nevada, that could go for Wyoming, that could go for any American states. Now, the US is supposed to obtain this information. The US is a signatory to a multilateral group called the Financial Action Task Force, which is the primary anti-money laundering regulatory body internationally. The US is a signatory. But that doesn't matter if there's no enforcement behind it. There was an, an academic study from a couple years ago, 2014, a, a trio of researchers were looking for the easiest places to set up anonymous shell companies in the world. They contacted dozens and dozens, hundreds of other jurisdictions, and they found that in the US, corporate service providers in places like Delaware and Wyoming and Nevada, and I know I sound like a broken record for those three, but those are the primary ones, they had a lower transparency rate than any other country surveyed, lower than any other traditional tax haven, lower than any other developed country. It was here in the US. It was here in states like Nevada and Delaware and Wyoming that were not asking for information, not asking for identifying information, not caring who these people were setting up these companies. And the wrong kinds of people have already taken note. Last year, as we saw in the Paradise Papers, uh, I'm sorry, the Panama Papers, uh, Mossack Fonseca, the Panamanian law firm, revealed in the Panama Papers, specifically advocated that clients go to Nevada and Wyoming. The vice president of Equatorial Guinea, one of the most kleptocratic regimes in the world, set up his shell companies here in the US. Victor Boot, the greatest arms dealer of the past 30 years, set up his shell companies here in the US. Former Ukrainian prime minister, Pablo Lazarenko, set up his shell companies in a house in Cheyenne, Wyoming. I went to that house. It's next to a barber shop and a church. It's hidden in plain sight. And again, this is a country like Ukraine, which has broader national security implications. I'm sure we'll get into that a little bit later. The people setting up these companies, again, don't care. They're making money. The state is making money. No one is cracking down on them. I visited one of these gentlemen who sets up these companies in Reno. I asked him if even something like the Panama Papers has had any effect. And he said no. It's made no difference to him whatsoever. There's been no pressure from the state. He certainly feels no pressure to stop making money. It's all perfectly legal. And the Wyoming Secretary of State issued a statement last year, almost Orwellian kind of statement, saying that Nevada and Delaware and Wyoming have been at the fore of transparency. They've been at the fore of pushing this. It's the complete antithesis of truth. It's a lie. But that's what these states are doing. It's a race to the bottom to serve kleptocrats. So that's one aspect. That's anonymous shell companies. I want to touch briefly, as the report does, also on anonymous trusts, because I had the chance to go to South Dakota, uh, Pierre, South Dakota, very small town, very small state. Currently, South Dakota has $220 billion in trusts. South Dakota has developed something called a perpetual trust. As many might be familiar, trusts usually run out in about a century or so. South Dakota, they can last and last and last because that's what the state legislators have done. The governor in South Dakota, in order to attract this money, set up a task force made of state legislators and higher ups at these trust firms which is about as clear an example of a captured state as you can find. 
This is higher ups at trust firms collaborating with state legislators to make laws that attract this kind of money. Hundreds of billions of dollars into the state. Nobody knows whose it is. Nobody knows who it belongs to. Nobody knows where it goes. One expert called it a tax haven. The other called it the Bermuda of the prairie. It's triple the rate what it was a decade ago. It shows no signs of slowing down now. Other states have already taken note. Montana, Alaska, eager to get in on this game. That goes for shell companies as well. So that's how the US has transformed into a global offshore haven. A combination of myopic federal policy, uh, a lack of reciprocity with other partners, and a handful of states more than willing to take a cut of this anonymity to set up these companies, these trusts, for any kind of actors come hell or high water, kleptocrats, arms dealers, oligarchs alike, and they'll keep doing it. They won't stop. There's no reason for them to. Not until Washington does something. The, the states are making money hand over fist. The general budgets are swelling in these states. It has to be Washington that sets up these registries to identify who is setting up these anonymous shell companies, potentially even these trusts moving forward. There's momentum, as we've seen with the senator and other discussions here in Washington, but it has to continue. The, the senator, Senator Whitehouse, had a quote that I'll also read in full because I think it sums up so much of what we're talking about today. He said, the light of corporate transparency is about to shine on criminal assets hidden in European shell companies, which means a lot of money will be looking for new, dark homes. The United States of America should take swift action to make sure that these criminal assets don't end up in opaque American shell companies. We know criminals, even terrorists, view the United States as their haven to hide illegal activity. This is a weaponizable weakness to harm our society and to enable it to be corrupted and to be so for deliberate political purposes by Vladimir Putin, who has this in his playbook. And he's absolutely right about the kind of people this attracts, the types of adversaries that look to America to help them entrench their rule, spread their brand of authoritarianism, and roll back the liberal democratic gains of the past three decades. That's what these people in the US are doing. That's what they're doing perfectly legally. And that's how we end up with the United States of anonymity. Mr. Blum. I'd be very hard pressed to disagree with anything the previous speakers have uh, said. But what I'd like to do is share with you the idea that part of this problem is American schizophrenia. There have been times when this offshore mess has served the foreign policy interests of the United States rather well. And, uh, to give you some examples, Ferdinand Marcos during the Cold War was our staunch ally. Uh, in the Caribbean, we had uh, Haiti and Baby Doc, Papa Doc and Baby Doc Duvalier. These are people who ripped the country off to the ground. We liked that because they were on side in the Cold War. Uh, the time to recover the money would have been the time when they left. But instead, the US used the money as a tool to convince people like Marcos and Mobutu and the like to leave office and quietly go somewhere else where they could enjoy the money they'd taken. Uh, when some years back, I tried to persuade people that the surest way to prevent kleptocratic behavior would be to go after the money they'd stolen. Uh, I was told by people in the government, in fact, in a meeting in this building, uh, that it would be against the interest of the United States because it would cause instability and we'd lose a very important foreign policy tool. So the first step here is to recognize that this is a schizophrenic situation. The other part of what makes it schizophrenic is the role of the dollar in the world economy. The dollar is a reserve currency. 
The fact that it's a reserve currency gives the United States enormous power. Making it a reserve currency means that all of this offshore business is uh, denominated in dollars. And the dollars wind up helping us in a variety of ways. There'll be some pain, I suggest, in uh, trying to rein in this crazy offshore world that's been created. Uh, the second point I'd like to put on the table for you is the thought that corporations have now taken on a role in our society that raises questions about Democrat, fundamental questions about democratic institutions. Uh, we now have corporations that can participate politically. That was Citizens United. We have corporations that can have religious beliefs, Hobby Lobby. We have corporations which are uh, put together in ways where you can't trace the money that they put into politics at all. Uh, that puts them in a position that's superior to those of you sitting around this room. Because when you participate in politics, you're known, and people will come at you and say, well, why did you say that? Why did you do that? Who are you to say that and do that? When people participate through some corporate shell, well, who's behind it? On the question of liability, if you're driving a car and you run somebody over, the hard fact is you'll pay for it. But corporations don't have that liability. So they're not participants in the society in the same way. I think we have to do a lot more in the way of thinking through what the role of the corporation should be and whether or not there should be any recognition of a corporation that has nominee officers, nominee directors, is not required to keep books and records, uh, and is untraceable. Why should the United States recognize that kind of corporation? What's going on here? Finally, what you really have to do is take a hard look at the reporting, both of the pa on the Panama Papers and on the Paradise Papers. The Paradise Papers were the clean side, supposedly, of the offshore business, whereas the Panama Papers were the criminal side. Well, clean is not so clean. And I would argue that uh, what that showed was the degree to which the American legal profession has upended one of the cardinal principles of being a lawyer. Uh, when I was sworn in as a member of the bar, I was told it was my responsibility as a lawyer to keep the laws of the society working, to get people to obey the laws of society, that it was my job to advise people on how to obey the laws of society. We now have a cast of lawyers who think their basic function is how to hide people and money from responding to the rules of the society, which is a complete reversal of what the lawyer should be doing. Uh, I have a kind of private crusade here. The American Bar Association has a section devoted to asset protection. Well, asset protection says to me that what these lawyers are doing is keeping assets away from legitimate court judgments, which is absolutely the reverse of what the profession should be doing. Uh, I tried to raise this with various people in the Bar Association, and I had to wait till the laughter subsided to get angry. Uh, these are very difficult problems, and they're problems we better tackle, and tackle sooner rather than later. Thank you. Uh, 
Thank you, Jack. Um, before we get into a discussion, each of our uh, esteemed panelists will speak for, uh, well, they will be respondents too, and uh, speak for, uh, hope say, you know, no more than five to seven, seven minutes, and, uh, and we'll take it from there. Um, and we might as well start with Elise, and then we can move down to uh, Mark and Ben. Good morning. Um, my name is Elise Bean. I worked for Senator Carl Levin for 30 years, 15 of those on uh, the Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations, where we did a lot of investigations into kleptocrats. And what we were focusing on was the role of US financial institutions. The good news is we've made a lot of progress in the years since we started investigating. Back in 1999, we looked at Citibank Private Bank and how they had hundreds of accounts for senior uh, p foreign political figures. Um, we looked in particular at uh, Mr. Bongo, the president of Gabon. We looked at Mr. Obiang, who was the president of Equatorial Guinea, um, and several others as well. And we showed how they were using the bank to hide money. The bank would not only create shell companies for them, but enable them to move money around the world across international lines, would help them invest the money so that they can have a lot more, would give them loans to help them get reelected and to engage in other kinds of businesses. This is what our banks were doing. And at the time, it was not against the law because there was no law, even if you knew that foreign money was a product of bribery or corruption, at the time, that was not a predicate offense for US money laundering prosecution. As long as all the bad stuff happened outside the United States, you could take the money into the United States. And our banks were becoming the bankers for dictators and kleptocrats around the world. Uh, we had cases of uh, Mr. Obiang uh, bringing in $3 million deposits in cash. His uh, private banker at uh, Citibank would uh, bring in these suitcases of plastic wrapped you know, cash, three million is a lot. That's like a duffel bag full. It's, you've got to be strong to bring that in. And we had a couple of occasions where he brought in the three million dollars cash, cashed it, and Riggs said, fine. And this was at actually Riggs Bank. I take it back. It wasn't Citibank. It was Riggs Bank. And they would cash it. We had another example of Riggs Bank, which was a bank here in the nation's capital that specialized in foreign embassies and foreign leaders. Uh, we had another case where they... Um, were helping out Pinochet uh, from Chile. And what they did for him is when he had a worldwide freeze on his assets, Riggs just took $1.6 million from their branch in London, brought it back here to the United States, put it in an account for a shell company that they had set up for him, and didn't tell anybody. It didn't come out uh, to the public until years later when we were looking at it in 2004. Um, in every case that we looked at, what the banks were doing was were creating shell corporations to hide the identity of the account holder where this cash was coming in. Things are better today. You can no longer walk into a bank with $3 million cash, and the bank will accept it with no questions asked, as was the case when we got started. Things are better than they are, than they were. Mr. Obiang can no longer open a, an account. He's known as a person who is uh, affiliated with corruption. He can't get an account anymore, so things are better. But we still have a lot of problems, and in particular, this shell company problem. Right now, banks are supposed to know who are behind the, their account holders. But when they have a shell company, they are currently having to do the investigation themselves. What they want is some help. They want some help from the country. They want to say to the United States, would you please, when these corporations are created in the United States, ask who the beneficial owners are. Ask who they are, the people setting it up, who's going to benefit from these companies, who's going to own these companies, direct them, find out, at least ask, and then put criminal and civil penalties on people who lie. If you can just take those two steps, that's going to help us, because when we open an account for a US shell company, we can say, give us your form that you filed with the government under penalty of perjury, so that we know who's behind this company. And that's where the state of the, uh, of the work is right now. The rest of the, of the world is forging ahead. Their corporate registries do ask for beneficial information. They do get those forms. In Switzerland, they require something called Form A. You have to fill it out, say who's behind your shell company. As the rest of the world goes forward and we don't, more and more of those people looking for some place to hide are going to get US shell companies. So now is the time to do something about it and help out our financial institutions that are trying to do the right thing. 
Great. Thank you, Elise. And um, thank you all very much for having me here today. Thank you, Charles. Um, I should start by way of a small apology. Uh, apology. I apologize for being late in part because I didn't want to keep you all waiting, um, I, but also because um, this is a report that I'm really excited to see and really glad Casey took on. Uh, I remember a few years back, it might have been at the end of a coalition meeting or perhaps in a bar where a few of us sat down and thought, you know, we should really do a report on the states what they're doing, what their, their role in all this. And I think the t working title we had was something like Axis of Secrecy. So I'm um, not far off there. Um, so I'm really pleased that uh, you've been able to tackle this report and uh, glad to be able to speak to it today. Um, hearing others' comments and reflecting on this, um, I'm struck by a, f a few things. First, um, the perceptual challenge we have in terms of dealing with how we perceive this problem as advocates challenging corruption and kleptocracy versus how it's perceived in the states by the practitioners who are involved in this in this business. Um, the second is just how much has changed in, in several decades that's led us to here. Some of it has been intentional, but some of it is almost a, an a organic outgrowth of globalization and it's worth reflecting on. Um, but the third, uh, to Lisa's point, in spite of s some of the things that uh, Casey has mentioned in his report about how tough things are getting, um, there is also sort of uh, some light at the end of the tunnel uh, insofar as the advocacy work to change um, people's perceptions of the role the American shell companies play in this is working. We're seeing those impacts even at the state level in terms of how state officials are responding to that pressure. Um, so Global Witness comes to this from over 20 years of work doing investigations and advocacy into uh, the links between natural resources, corruption, and conflict. And simply put, we've worked on the Shell Company issue for uh, nearly eight years now because in nearly every investigation that we've conducted, we've come across this pattern as well. Um, shell companies are used um, to, to move illicit funds from shady natural resources deals um, out of the countries that, that those deals are conducted from their point of origins. They're used to launder those proceeds, clean them um, through intricate um, company ownership structures that obfuscate the ownership and the origin of the funds, and used to place that money back into the system um, as a way for those individuals involved um, to spend that money in the way that which, to which they're accustomed. Um, but in Coming to that work from our perception, you know, from our perspective, we're very committed to tackling this because we see it as a key vehicle uh, for tackling corruption um, in those sectors. Um, but we and many others have, have taught us and we've shared with them that um, this isn't limited to the areas of kleptocracy and corruption. Pretty much any sort of illicit activity that you look at, whether it's human trafficking, gun trafficking, um, uh, consumer fraud, credit card fraud, you name it, any illicit activity that generates money, chances are a shell company is involved somewhere. And I think therein lies the challenge, because all of the different advocates, whether they're law enforcement groups, um, public officials, or others, um, are often looking at those issues um, uh, from their own perspective, looking at the crime in total, and not seeing the links between this practice in their sector and their practice in another. So that's a critical piece that we all need to make the linkages for them. I think that's happening. Um, but the benefit is that, that means that there's a broad range of stakeholders who would benefit from tackling this transparency problem in a meaningful way by, by zeroing in on the role that shell companies play um, in the kleptocracy realm, we can also um, focus on how it solves other problems. So real quickly, and I'll, I'll pass on to others. One, we need to challenge the idea that um, what's happening at the state level is simply the way that business is done. When you talk to practitioners there, particularly in, in those um, agencies that are setting up companies, they simply see it as their job to make it as easy as possible for people to form companies, no questions asked. Some of that is innocent and some of that is a bit mendacious, um, but that's how people perceive it on the ground and we need to challenge that, really kind of pull off the fig leaf um, that people are using to say this is just how America does business when in fact um, this is tarnishing the good name of American business. The second is, is that we got here in part because of the explosive growth of this industry. Um, the laws that set up shell companies and other legal entities you know, are over a century old in some respects um, and almost antiquated. Um, but over the last couple of decades, as barriers to capital movement have been um, brought down, neoliberal policies have been brought in in a number of different ways, um, people have both organically and opportunistically taken advantage of those laws to use these vehicles for other purposes or have accelerated the development of new um, entities, LLCs are one example, to really take advantage of those things. So we got here in part because of that practice and now we're seeing kind of the bitter fruit of that and that needs to be part of our narrative. Um, but the last piece and the piece of hope here is that um, work like this report, 
work done by a broad range of stakeholders like Elise, like others here, by the FAT Coalition, um, by the media really exposing the role that, that um, not only offshore havens have played in facilitating this kind of activity, but the U.S.'s increasingly prominent role is having an impact. We're seeing through our conversations um, with state level officials, small business leaders, even some of the secretaries of state who have been quite recalcitrant on this issue that privately, they recognize the writing is on the wall and it's really just a question of how far we can get here. So the challenge is, is can we tip that balance now, change that perception and use that um, to really change the paradigm we're working in. Oh, well just before I sort of uh, give a few remarks, I'd like to just sort of congratulate uh, Casey for such an incredible report. And I want to say that what makes this report so special is that it combines a journalist reporting with a think tank's thoroughness and sort of literacy and legality and statistics, but also like the political essayist's pen sort of brought together uh, with flair and original thinking. So just congratulations uh, once again. I'd also like to thank everyone at the, the Hudson Institute, and especially Charles Davidson, who, who made this possible. After such a thorough analysis of the, the problem from so many leading experts, it's quite hard to, to come afterwards, uh, really. So I thought I would bring some of my... Um, experiences from outside the United States, from traveling through Russia, uh, Ukraine, uh, Western Europe, and lately Pakistan, to show what are the global effects of the United States becoming this United States uh, of uh, anonymity. And there are two trends which I think are worth uh, thinking about, which are interlinked, the trend of intellectual ra radicalization and the trend of delegitimization of a certain way of thinking or talking about the United States and current political thinking associated uh, with it. If one spends time in Ukraine and one spends time in Kiev, one will see that over the last few years, as awareness has grown that the United States and uh, Western Europe's financial system has been acting as the enablers of a corrupt and looting oligarch uh, class personified, um, but by no means sort of uh, uh, finalized with uh, the former president uh, Yanukovych. There has been an increasing delegitimization of the idea that the West represents a model, a superior um, version of uh, the political system, or that it has uh, moral authority. And there's been an increasing radicalization with people uh, blaming the West and blaming the Western uh, enabled offshore system as being the source and the enablers of this uh, political looting. And this is uh, helping reactionary, nationalist, and sort of pro-Putin political forces uh, in that country, and it's also increasingly feeding into a narrative propagated by Moscow, which is, is that the West and uh, Russia, that the United States and Russia are equivalent, and that Ukraine is better placed within uh, an orbit of Russian uh, authoritarianism. So needless to say, the way the United States is currently sort of comporting itself in the international financial system is undermining the forces in Ukraine that it is politically supporting and that it is uh, politically sort of uh, try, politically associating with its uh, values. If you cross the border into Russia, again, this growing uh, awareness and this exposure through the Panama Papers and the Paradise Papers and surely the papers uh, yet to come that it is Again, the United States and Western European uh, sort of uh, fi financial systems that are enabling the uh, sort of looting of Russia by a kleptocratic uh, class of the associates of uh, Vladimir Putin is discrediting that idea that and delegitimizing the idea that the West is a superior democratic rules-based model that should be that Russians should uh, seek to emulate, and it's radicalizing um, nationalists and uh, hard, nationalist, hard left, and sort of uh, sort of so-called Eurasianist uh, voices uh, within the debate in Russia that say that uh, there are alternative development models which are even more uh, authoritarian than the one currently offered by uh, Putin. 
Uh, I was recently in uh, Pakistan, and just as an illustration that this debate about uh, offshore, this debate about money laundering in real estate, that this debate about uh, shell companies isn't a sort of rarefied debate for uh, academics and for ourselves and something that's taking place in uh, charming halls uh, in Washington and in uh, uh, London, is that I was at a mass rally in the town of Mandi Bahadim, a sort of uh, nowhere special town in the rural Punjab, but is nevertheless a place where elections are decided uh, in Pakistan. Now, this mass rally of between 20 and 30,000 people, the populist uh, leader Imran Khan was addressing this crowd saying, the source of your problems is that your elite are kleptocrats, they're money laundering, the money is being placed in London, the money is being placed in the West, it is Western enablers that are the source of your problems. And is that really how we, we want um, the sort of good people of Mandi Badin, who are very normal, who are the typical people of Pakistan, to, uh, be, to, to see us, to see uh, the Western financial system as effectively a sort of kleptocratic racket? Do we really want those people seeing uh, the Western business class as being uh, in cahoots with uh, those that are asset stripping uh, their country. And I think I, I'd like us to think about uh, Senator Whitehouse's comments about where will this lead in the long term? Is this really what we want to, to see, this sort of growing enmity against uh, the Western financial system in uh, emerging or submerging uh, countries? Now, a kind of final point about radicalization and delegitimization that you may not expect. And I wouldn't really call them my travels in London, but I think I have something to report to you uh, from there. There's obviously been a lot of focus on the rise of the populist right and the takeover of the populist right in many ways uh, in Anglo-Saxon countries over the far past few years. But there has been uh, very little discussion about the dramatic rise of the populist left in Britain and in France, where the main opposition to the government in Paris and in London are now populist uh, left-wing parties who are promoting a pretty radical agenda uh, of which I think would uh, alarm people who identify as uh, centrists and people who identify uh, as uh, conservatives. And I think the, I, what this shows is that the idea that you can continue such a setup and such policies um, and not expect there to be any repercussions in a domestic uh, political uh, system, I think, is false. And I, would, uh, I feel confident that at some point over the next five years, there will be a populist left government in um, Western Europe. And that will have a pretty dramatic effect, I think, on the debate of ideas uh, across uh, the uh, Western world. Uh, whether or not it will be Prime Minister Corbyn or not, uh, I'm not sure, but uh, it is worth saying that in current British uh, opinion polls, he is uh, the favorite to be the Prime Minister uh, sooner, uh, sooner or later. So um, if individuals who I identify as like strong supporters of the classically defined uh, sort of market system in the US or in Western Europe are, are keen on uh, defending it, they have to make sure that it's perceived as uh, legitimate within their own societies, or you'll, uh, you'll soon be seeing uh, even more uh, challenges uh, to it than we uh, already have. So, so thank you. And now sort of... Uh, we should, Marvelous. Thank we should uh, debate. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> ah, well, well, generating debate here may be a, a bit of a challenge. I'm not sure. Now, before we go on, I would like Nate Sibley to stand, and I would like to thank him because he really has put this whole thing together. Nate, it's okay to stand. It's not going to... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd also like to thank Nate for writing my introductory remarks. Uh, <laughs> and I made a few changes. I changed a few words and crossed out a small paragraph, but otherwise I, I kept that. Um, and I'd also like to mention that uh, tomorrow at 10 a.m. at Hudson Institute, uh, we are going to present a very important paper by Ben Judah and Belinda Lee, who is on the staff of the Kleptocracy Initiative and who is somewhere here, I think, 
I, I can't see. Oh, there. Would you like to stand, Belinda? Little Alexis. And um, uh, this isn't a digression because uh, this report picks up in a broader way on a lot of the things that we have in, uh, in, in Casey's work. And what we've tried to do is to put together a lot of pieces. Uh, so we end up with an anti-kleptocracy quilt, which keeps growing. Uh, and uh, and the, the paper we're going to present tomorrow is on this issue of Western enablement of kleptocracy broadly. And it looks at all the different aspects that we could identify of this problem. Um, now, I, I think uh, it's been an interesting progression from the specific to the uh, general and, and the global geopolitics on this question. And um, uh, I hope if, if you ever encounter someone who is skeptical about this whole anonymous company issue, just hand, it, hand Casey's report to them. And then if they're unconvinced, you can maybe suggest they probably didn't read the report. A little bit the way my, my partner in the American Interest magazine, Frank Fukuyama's book, The End of History and the Last Man, has not been read by most of its critics. So uh, a similar uh, method should, should uh, be identified here. And I would like to, just to point out one thing about Casey's paper, which is uh, really quite original, and that's his discovery of these trusts vehicles being uh, cropping up uh, in the middle of the prairie, or prairies of our country, uh, because it seems as though people are already anticipating passage of anti-anonymous company legislation, and they're looking for other tricks. Uh, and just as a, as a parenthesis, I, I know a very eminent trust and estates lawyer, and her attitude is, oh, you know, you, you pass this stuff, we're going to just find other ways to get around it. So. It's, I mean, the, all of this stuff is, is, I mean, the cops and robbers game is something that is part of um, the human condition. And uh, the idea is that the uh, cops be winning most of the time as opposed to losing. And right now on this issue, we want to reverse that. Um, now, what I was thinking would be interesting to, to start this off, and then we can be rather informal. I don't, we have uh, 25 minutes and I don't want to be calling on anyone. We can have a conversation. But I think it might be interesting to go into the politics a little more on, on, a, on a higher level and something that, uh, I mean, uh, Jack told us some things, but he can supplement some of his thoughts and Elise has had a huge amount of experience on these questions. And I would, I would sort of put on the table one thing, which is global Magnitsky, because there seems to be some skepticism about this anonymous company legislation passing. Uh, and I'm increasingly heartened by what's going on on the Hill in a very bipartisan way. I mean, we have three bills floating around, two in the Senate, one in the House. And uh, it seems to me if global Magnitsky could pass almost unanimously, why not this? I mean, this seems a lot less controversial, really. Uh, so um, my own personal view is that we actually may see passage. And despite bizarre events of this week and things that may occur, there, there seems to be surprising bipartisan support for this. Um, so if anybody wants to comment on any possible thoughts uh, involving links to Global Magnitsky and what's going on with that, and then, uh, or and then to to talk about the politics behind all of this. I mean, we've lamented the existence of this, of these vehicles in our country, uh, but what about the politics of all of this and how we may see passage and, uh, uh, et cetera? So, would anyone like to uh, kick off on that? Well, I'll start it off. Um, we thought that this getting legislation passed to have more transparency uh, with companies formed in the United States would be a no-brainer. I mean, you have to give more information right now to get a library card than you do have to set up a, a shell company in the United States. And we had extremely strong support from law enforcement across the board. Uh, they, spend, they spin their wheels a lot trying to find out who's behind shell companies. It eats up a lot of resources, time, and quite often they can't go ahead and, and do a case because they can't find who's behind a corporation uh, that was transmitting the money or whatever. Um, but to our surprise, we, we came up with a bunch of uh, political opponents. And the first ones were the secretaries of state. Uh, the states make a lot of money from their incorporations. And they were worried that if they asked any questions, uh, 
then somebody would go to a different state. It's sort of where the banks were 40 years ago. You know, if we ask questions, nobody's going to want to open up an account with us. Well, we found out that people need bank accounts even if you ask them questions, and people are going to need U.S. Sh you know, corporations even if you ask questions. But the first group that really opposed us, and, and they're only now starting to back off a little bit, uh, were the secretaries of state. Uh, a second group, and what I would say to them is, most of that business you have is legitimate. If you have greater transparency, it's not going to be a problem because you're talking about only a very small percentage of corporations that you really don't want to have as your clients anyway. Second big opponent was the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, still an opponent of the bill. Um, even though many large businesses have endorsed the bill, um, the Clearinghouse, which is the 12 largest banks in the United States, has endorsed it. The uh, Independent Community Bankers Association, the credit unions, virtually all of the banking institutions want this legislation because they want some help. Uh, in addition, there are a number of businesses, uh, Dow Chemical, there's um, Virgin Atlantic, and a bunch of com large companies have endorsed it as well. Small businesses uh, often want it because they want to know who these opponents are that are coming into their communities and having all kinds of money. And uh, the large companies also want to know who's in their supply chain. They don't want to get egg on their face when they find out somebody that they're dealing with is not somebody that they wanted to be dealing with. Um, sometimes people say, oh, this is such a burden on small business. Well, my mom owned a, a cosmetic shop in St. Louis. Uh, it was called Judy Bean Limited. Guess who the owner was? Judy Bean, all right? Small businesses don't have complicated, weirdo ownership problems. They're going to create a burden for them. Yes, who owns your company? The answer is I do. It's not, a, it's not a burden for small business. The third group that we've had are the lawyers. The uh, American Bar Association has been a big opponent of this. And that's because, you know, if you, uh, unfortunately, a lot of attorneys make money off of forming these shell corporations and designing these very complicated structures. Uh, I'll let Global Witness talk about the, the, the work that they did on that, but they found that, you know, out of 13 law firms contacted in uh, New York City about setting up certain kinds of structures, only one said, I'm not doing it. The other 12 were like, well, let me help you. Let me offer you some ideas. So those have been the main opponents we've had, and um, I think gradually even all of them are becoming embarrassed about uh, the blowback on them, the, the tarnishment of their own reputation. So I'm hopeful that the politics is getting better and that as we have bipartisan support when we see the threats to national security, to uh, crime, I mean, you talk about health care, you know, fraud, you talk about accounting fraud, you talk about any kind of financial crime in the United States, there's a lot of money involved, there's also a shell company involved. Um, well, I'd like to talk about the politics in the United Kingdom as uh, uh, something really sort of to, to take into account in the United States in sort of going forward. So over the lo Britain seems to be a few steps ahead of the United States uh, in terms of these debates about is there a crisis of legitimacy in the current uh, financial system. And over the last few years, one saw first a conversation actually very similar to Charles's uh, film We're Not Broke uh, emerging in the British left that... Charles and Jack's film We're Not oh, sorry, Broke, I should the, say. Sorry. Sorry, the, the, <laughs> Jack was the uh, brains behind it by far. <laughs> my apologies, sir. But, um, well, the, well, there was a, a very similar um, uh, conversation emerging on the British left, similar to my esteemed uh, friend's uh, uh, film, We're Not Broke, um, which pointed out that as austerity was being inflicted on the British people and cutbacks were being made on public services, the fact that there was more money in British offshore tax havens than there is in Britain's entire annual GDP led to a conversation that, in fact, the so-called need for uh, austerity and uh, cutbacks uh, was illegitimate, and that there is a, there is a real fundamental need to redress the, um, the sort of economic uh, uh, system. That debate then fed into another debate, which is that as austerity was impacting um, people, uh, millennials and were finding it extremely difficult to buy property, a debate emerged in the UK linking um, uh, the uh, 
unaffordability of house prices in uh, London rippling out in other cities to the fact that property has been used as a money laundering device through anonymous offshore, uh, shell, anonymous offshore shell companies. Within the British left, these two conversations had increasingly come together and helped push the majority of voters who elected the sort of new leader of, of the uh, Labour Party to choose a more, rad a more radical, populist, uh, left-wing sort of option. And these conversations that were going on uh, actually had uh, an impact. And so I think that it's, it, I would, I think that one actually sees that similar path beginning to uh, develop here. And what I find so striking about the current conversation in these buildings linked with current, the current tax bill, linked with current attitudes towards public cutbacks and tax cuts uh, for millionaires and billionaires is the assumption that there will be no intellectual or political reaction. And um, I think that if you look at Britain or indeed at France, where the main opposition party is now uh, effectively Jean-Luc uh, Mélenchon's uh, populist uh, left, even though not quite in Parliament, but definitely at least uh, in the streets and intellectually, I think that we can expect some serious uh, surprises. And if one reads conservative thought from the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, there was an intense uh, awareness um, that in order for the market uh, system to, and uh, social democracy uh, to remain largely competitive uh, compared to other more radical and potentially dangerous uh, populist alternatives. It had to uh, be perceived to be delivering for the majority of the population and not simply uh, the rich. And it strikes me that that conversation uh, has, uh, is one that we're in urgent need of reviving. Yeah. <clears throat> I'd like to go back to the question of what we can do to get corporations properly identified. Uh, the pending legislation uh, focuses on having the secretaries of state maintain registers and not having a public register, uh, a public layout of who's behind what and what they're doing. Now, why is that important? I've recently been involved in a case where uh, a guy was suing an insurance company because they had stiffed him on a claim. He was angry. He was very wealthy. What he did was try to track down what had happened in his case. And it turned out this insurance company sort of disintegrated into a nest of subsidiaries, all in different jurisdictions. Uh, one subsidiary handled the underwriting, another subsidiary handled the claims, a third subsidiary uh, handled other aspects of the case, and the main lawyer who was suing had to go from one jurisdiction to another to try to pry loose uh, the information he needed because it was all in different places, carefully protected by separate corporations. In the case of financial crime, and this is again based on my own experience, uh, civil enforcement or civil recovery uh, is the best remedy because prosecutors hate like hell to go after financial crime that crosses borders when they don't necessarily have a defendant in their grasp and the money is not in their grasp and the evidence may be God knows where. They don't have the money for it. They don't have the time for it. The only people who can do it are people who are going after civilly. So to have information that's only available to law enforcement uh, doesn't necessarily do it. The idea that some of this stuff is going to be reported to the government is another idea that, well, that's good, but, and the but is this, who's going to read the material? Who's going to actually act on the material? Uh, what we don't want to have happen is have a lot of information reported and then have it turn into a lending library which will be available once a case has been brought. 
what we really want to have is something that allows the society to see what's going on. And because of that sunlight, uh, perhaps the bad things won't continue to go on. Uh, this aspect of fraud cases have to be pursued civilly is something that not enough attention has been paid to. And the shell company and the nest of shell companies is a huge barrier to any kind of civil recovery. Uh, to give you an example, uh, the state of Sao Paulo was ripped off by its governor. This is the state of Sao Paulo in Brazil. They hired a law firm in Jersey that specializes in asset recovery. It took that law firm 10 years of litigating to track down the assets and actually begin to get a court order to recover the money for the state. And this is one of the very few successful large-scale recoveries. In virtually every other case, the cases have wound up compromised uh, at some number that's acceptable to whoever did the ripoff, and uh, it ends in, in some kind of settlement because the cost of pursuing things is just far too great. One other point. Uh, I mentioned before the role of the Treasury Department in protecting a lot of the stuff that we're worrying about. A prime example from my perspective is the regulations uh, that IRS puts out with respect to beneficial ownership. In theory, corporations are supposed to file forms called W-8-B-E-Ns that explain who the beneficial ownership of the company is to IRS. And if you read the directions that accompany the uh, form, it seems that there'll be pretty full disclosure. But if you go back and look at the underlying regs, the regs say something else completely. They say the company is its own owner. Huh? How can that be? Now, this was repeatedly brought to the attention of IRS. Uh, reg proposals were, uh, changes were proposed. And again and again, Treasury vetoed it. So this is part and parcel of the schizophrenia uh, that we're dealing with. Mark? A couple of thoughts. Sure. Thanks, Jack. Um, that's really useful insights. Um, real quickly, because I know we probably want to talk about a few other topics, to speak to your original question, Charles, around Global Magnitsky and the comparisons, I think the one that strikes me is, arguably, um, the progress made on Global Magnitsky and all the surrounding sort of legislative work as well as the dialogue around it demonstrates that even in a polarized environment that we are here living in in Washington, that there are still some small areas of common ground politically that um, individuals on the left, right, and center can look at the threat posed by kleptocratic regimes in Russia and, and associated states and recognize that whether your top priority is human rights in an expansive notion, whether it's U.S. national security, whether it's um, a range of things, there's common cause to, to tackle that in a meaningful and productive way. Um, by uh, pursuing a sanctions regime. On the one hand, I see the opportunity of beneficial ownership transparency is very similar. We've heard from everyone here today in that regard. Um, and I think that when you um, look at, when you talk to the people who are in the trenches dealing with this sort of thing, whether it's a law enforcement uh, practitioner, whether it's someone pursuing a civil fraud case, whether it's the civil society groups combating this elsewhere, who really understand the linkages between the lack of transparency and what it perpetuates, um, as well as the public officials who have done that, then you see people really understanding how it fits together and why this is not really should be seen as a left or right issue. Um, and you see people committing to moving forward to making progress on that issue. Um, that's the promise um, in the comparison. The peril is that um, despite that, um, even now, as we're making progress on this bill, as we're seeing pushback from a range of, of voices, some of which at least mention but some new ones who, you know, let's give them the benefit of the doubt. They're, they're com maybe coming from legitimate places, but to, in some sense, they don't really have a dog in this fight. They haven't spent much time digging into the details of what it means to disclose company ownership, et cetera. Um, all they see is a set of issues that fits within their kind of political paradigm. This is either good or bad, and they're reacting. This is a civil liberties threat. This is something, and, and I think I would argue, 
greatly exaggerating or exacerbating the perceived threats or pitfalls of those things simply because they've not taken the time to, to work through that. And I think the best example of where we could get to really is actually comes back to the UK. When the UK decided to establish a registry that was done through sort of a political consensus that understood the need to balance privacy with transparency, the need to address the role that, that shell companies plays in perpetuating domestic international problems. And um, the registry has now been online for roughly a year and a half. Um, it still has flaws, but it's made remarkable progress. And to give you an example, Global Witness worked with a range of other groups to do kind of a spot check on the data there that we did in collaboration with Companies House, the agency that oversees um, management of it. And um, a few things stood out. First, we found that of, I think, roughly 3 million companies that are registered in, in the U.S. Companies House Registry 3.5, Within about six months, um, 1.3 million companies had actually effectively registered their beneficial owners. So first of all, there are 1.3 million companies that were able in a short period of time with a new set of guidance able to actually get on the books. And of those, about 98% um, reported they had no trouble complying with the new rules. Um, so when we're talking about concerns about business compliance cost, when you actually get down and build the tool that's needed to address the problem and smart-minded civ civil servants are dedicated and they have the full political backing, we can create a tool that works. Um, and I'll note that Jack's point about public, you know, while politically I think we're not there yet here in the U.S. and we'd like to get there, um, I will say that the value of the public registry is that not only do you have civil servants who are working to make the product better, you have groups like ours and others who can help improve the product. We went through and combed through the data and found simple ways they could change the product to make it easier to make the data more valuable and also to make it easier for people to comply with those issues. So I think to pull it tie back that if we can get the right coalition of serious-minded folks on left, right, and center who understand this from a whole perspective and are serious about finding an effective solution we can make this happen. But if it's subjected to the vicissitudes of partisan politics simply because people see something that they're scared of, that, that's where we're going to run into some problems. I'd like to add that people predicted the world would end if you made public registry available with beneficial owners. Guess what? The world did not end. When we set up corporations, the whole point of them was to limit personal liability so that you could engage in business was never intended to hide people's ownership. And uh, when they made that information public, the world did not end. In fact, everything worked just fine. <laughs> Casey, any, yeah, there, oh, Jack? Yeah. There's an underlying question, uh, which perhaps is food for thought. Why should any developed country with a real economy accept incorporation from a country, let's say, like St. Kitts, where you can incorporate, and in that country there are no records of the corporation, the board of directors are nominees, nobody on the island knows what the corporation does, where it operates, where its bank accounts are, uh, and uh, the corporation has no presence, which is to say, there's nobody there who's making decisions. The decisions are all being made somewhere else by somebody else. Uh, God knows who they are. And typically, if you look in the file of the uh, firm that sets up the corporation in these offshore places, the directors have all signed and undated resignation letters as directors. In cases uh, that have turned up in the Cayman Islands, as a case in point, the people who set up these corporations have very artfully all uh, signed contracts with each other and the people setting it up, saying that we will not be liable for anything that happens with respect to this corporation. So the lawyers exempt themselves from liability. The company formation agents exempt themselves from liability, and the nominee directors exempt themselves from liability. Now, the people who are complaining about this are trustees in bankruptcy who can't find anybody to go after. Uh, it strikes me that a company that sets itself up in that format should have no ability to do business in the world's banking systems, in commerce, in anything else, uh, there should be a line of responsibility. And uh, there was a time when, believe it or not, there were requirements 
corporations were not recognized unless there were available books and records. Trustees or, or members of the board had to be identified. Uh, in this offshore world, none of that happens. Uh, finally, the, the Paradise Papers are really quite useful in understanding what's going on because when you look at them, what you discover is the corporations and sophisticated individuals have done nothing illegal, but they have come up with a process for putting themselves completely outside the law of any jurisdiction, which is quite a remarkable achievement. Uh, they have made it so that they're not taxable, uh, they can't be sued, because there are so many different layers to this process, and the structures are so complex. Uh, nobody can access enough information in a timely fashion to do anything. Uh, yeah. I think the early on example of this would be the famous Union Carbide case in Bhopal, India. That litigation, believe it or not, is still pending. Uh, you would think that what is it, 30 years on, uh, somebody would have figured out how to get through to the right people and find some assets to fully pay and compensate for what happened. Well, uh, we just have one minute left, uh, so I, and I'm gonna make a very brief comment on what uh, Jack said, because I think what will, um, if let's say the anonymous company legislation were to pass, uh, in terms of the international effects and the, uh, the, the um, treasure islands of this world and the smaller jurisdictions, obviously we would potentially have huge leverage just the way we use the FCPA as a sort of uh, global uh, copster. Uh, we might, might have some uh, leverage uh, here too uh, between our, our banking system, uh, the dollar, and, uh, and other enforcement things we already have in place. Uh, uh, so, in the, in, in the remaining uh, 30 seconds to a minute, Casey, do you have a, uh, a, a concluding thought? <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> yes, I, I do have a concluding thought. I think, uh, uh, Charles, just to back to uh, your, your initial question as it pertains to the current state of affairs, current uh, perceived momentum uh, about corporate transparency, I think one of that, as we saw with Global Magnitsky, is this injection of uh, a national security component within that, within broader questions of uh, 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 Russian interference, uh, Russian monies, Russian uh, funding. Uh, unfortunately, it, it's taken too long. Yeah, unfortunately, we've gotten to this point where it required uh, 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 that sort of boogeyman to uh, push this to the finish line. And I just wanted to turn to uh, uh, something that Elise worked on with uh, Senator Levin once upon a time uh, as it pertained to the Riggs Bank and Equatorial Guinea, which was, I think it was in 2004 when the uh, final report came out. 2004, there was this unveiling of how the Obiang family uh, came to the U.S. to stash their money to set up their shell companies. That report came out, and, and Mr. Obiang, still in power, uh, uh, his son, now vice president, his son, even though uh, afterward was still able to set up shell companies here in the U.S., uh, DOJ in 2010 reached a, a settlement excuse me, with him uh, uh, taking his Malibu uh, uh, beachfront. Unfortunately, it wasn't in time to prevent uh, uh, Obiang from uh, taking uh, his private jet out of the U.S. And on that private jet, presumably, Michael Jackson's crystal-studded glove with him. And, and we haven't been able to recover that since. So that's my concluding thought. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.